for everyone. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some recent work we've done that's sort of pulling together maybe two or three threads. A lot of the motivations are coming from recent work in random um, matrix theory being applied to various sort of machine learning problems. And I think that a lot of the problems you encounter in machine learning are, are rather different than maybe typical applications in the past of random matrix theory. And so I want to describe that, but I wanted to sort of give a little bit of a historical pro progression. Um, talk about some basically empirical results. So there are theorems that you can find in current machine learning papers that say, you know, if, if a model follows a marchenko pasteur distribution and such and such, then I get certain results. And I, it's, a, it's sort of an empirical question, does the model look like that? Or is it sort of roughly that, but not exactly? So that's a reasonable null model, or is it sort of completely different than that? And so I wanna look at some empirical results and then I wanna to put together um, a theory. And so theory is a word that I think means two different things in different communities. One is sort of statistical learning theory, which is a bunch of theorems. So I wanna distinguish between theory and theorems here. I wanna develop a theory that could be used to predict properties of, of state-of-the-art machine learning models. So there's no theorems there, it's a, it's a theory. If you want to call it a phenomenology or semi-empirical theory or whatever, that's okay. But it, it's the sort of thing you do in science. You don't prove ice, you build bridges by proving theorems about icing models. You, you have a theory of, of how things behave and it might have parameters in it. Um, and then the theory is gonna make predictions and I'll describe some of those predictions that, that we can do. And then from that, um, in a lot of cases, you want to establish theorems either because you want um, the mathematics is interesting or because it provides a framework to do certain sort of engineering building systems. And so I want to talk about some work we're doing on um, teasing out sort of key structural components to have a, a framework for theorems. And um, on the theorem side, looking ahead, one of the key things that you see in a lot of state-of-the-art machine learning models is the following. I mean, it's, it's not the case that you would want necessarily or that matrix concentration, for example, results would be particularly useful, um, for instance, or Johnson Lindenstoss type results. A lot of the theory goes through that, but sort of the informal reason why they might be less directly relevant or useful to guide what's going on is if you have a, a data set, it's some size, and you train some model and do something with it, um, then ask yourself, what, what are you going to do if your data set is a factor of 10 larger or a factor of 100 larger? Are you going to work with the same model or are you going to make the model bigger? So in, in least squares, this is you know, N and P. I have N data points, I have P predictors, and I have an N by P matrix. If you fix P and let N diverge, a lot of good things happen you know, for, for various limiting operations in random matrix theory. And if you fix N and let P diverge, the same is true. You got to put other structures like sparsity, but the same is going to be true. But when N and P diverge together, you're more in sort of a thermodynamic limit. And so a lot of the work there will involve going beyond eigenvalues and steel just transforms and random matrix theories to work with resolvents directly in this limit. But I want to motivate it first. I want to talk about some practice and um, theory and, and then get to the theorems. All right, so practice and theory and then a little bit more practice. And then I'll talk about the... Um, the sort of modularized theorems we're sort of putting together. All right, so um, I wanna present sort of the bottom line from a very large sort of empirical analysis. Um, training models is hard. I don't wanna train them. People at industry can train them a lot better and faster with 10,000 X more compute. So I wanna look at publicly available models. And I just wanna say, what do those models look like? So when we began this about four or five years ago, there was on the order of a couple of tens of models or dozens of models that were publicly available. I mean, I can go and download them and look at them. Someone trained them. I don't know why they trained them. I don't know if they trained them well or poorly. There's probably a selection bias to making public good models, but you know, I don't know. These are artifacts in the world. A year or two later, there was hundreds. Now there's thousands. That was a year ago. Now there's probably you know, 5,000 models that are publicly available. They tend to be in computer vision and natural language processing. So there's a selection bias there, but take them for what it's worth. So these are out there. There's no questions about doing non-reproducible things. You don't have to ask me about how I chose hyperparameters. You don't have to ask me to share the data with you that's probably proprietary, et cetera. These are artifacts in the world that you can go and you can ask a question like, what do state-of-the-art models look like? Was there a question? I don't think so. 
Okay, so some of the conclusions I'll talk will have obvious implications for training, but I'm, let's leave that off the table for right now. So I'm gonna look at the world. I'm gonna say, what are the properties of these state-of-the-art models in the world? And then we're gonna get theorems and theor theory and theorems out of this. Okay, um, so here's the, the bottom line from a large scale analysis. If you look at good models prior to about 2013, so for example, Lynette 5 on MNIST, which, is a, which was, I mean, you can look down your nose now, but 20, 25 years ago, this was state of the art. Um, you know, you have a two layer MLP, something very simple, um, train Lynette 5 to 99.8% accuracy, which is state of the art. And then you say, um, what are the properties of the model? Could I look at the model and learn something from the model if you didn't give me any data? And so it's easy to normalize column norms and elements and a lot of things. Um, one thing that's a little more subtle that's going to be core for what we're talking about is let's look at the eigenvalues. So I'm going to have a bunch of plots that look like this. And these are going to be eigenvalue distributions. So I have a weight matrix W. These are going to be eigenvalues of W transpose W, so singular values, but eigenvalues of the correlations. W, you know, as, you, as some of you probably know, um, if you have heavy tailed random matrices, you tend to get heavy tails on eigenvalues. That's not what's going on here. W element wise, if you look at it element wise, tends to look like Marchenko Pasteur. Um, but if you look at the correlations in W, namely W transpose W, what you see is the following. You get a shape here and you get a bunch of stuff sticking out. Um, zoom in. Um, the red is a, the best Marchenko Pasteur fit. You see some little stuff going on at the edge. So this is actually a very good fit if you played with these things. There's a little stuff going on at the edge and then there's a bunch of eigenvalues that stick out to five and all the way up to 20. So these are well beyond the Tracy Witten regime, if you know what that is. And so um, you have a bunch of eigenvalues that are pretty well fit by a random null model and then a bunch that stick out. And this is state of the art before about 2013. In 2013, there was a bit of an inflection point in computer vision and the natural language processing, the models got much larger. And you can look at, you know, thousands of models, 20,000 layers. Um, when you're gonna make a simple statement based on that much, there's a lot of exceptions and caveats, but the simple answer is absolutely none of the models look anything like that. They all look like this. So what I'm doing is showing you the same empirical spectral distribution. Um, and what you see is that red is still the best Marchenko Pasteur fit. But there's a huge amount of mass is eaten out from that. You don't have a nice um, concave thing sticking down with little at the edge with little fluctuations of the Tracy Witten regime, and they go out very far. Um, dealing with heavy tails and power law distributions is hard and finicky. So let me black box that and just say um, these are typically very well described by power law distributions or truncated power law distributions. That's hard to see on a linear linear plot, which I'm showing you here. You can see it on log log and log linear, but, but it's a little bit finicky. So let's just take it as a given that sort of everything post 2013 um, has this heavy tail structure, by which I mean, you know, 96% of the layers and you know, our power law are well fit by power law and, and truncated power laws. So um, why would they have this heavy tail structure? And this is absolutely nothing like the initialization, which is typically random Gaussian universality classes. This is absolutely nothing um, like a lot of current theorems would say. Um, and so, so why would this be the case and what would be the implications of this? So the weights are still element-wise Gaussian universality class. If you take the weight matrices and shuffle them up and look at the eigenvalues there, they're Marchenko Pasteur. Um, so the weights are scale one, say. The eigenvalues have a heavy tail structure, a power law structure. Okay, so here's a theory based on that. And um, 101 random matrix theory, probably all of you know this. You're gonna have some nice shape. It's gonna be a big semicircle law. You're interested in the fluctuations near the edge and how far you stick out from that. So we spent a lot of our time early on worrying about this. Now we've sort of modularized that. 102 is Marchenko Pasteur. It's sort of the same thing. You have a shape. It's not a semicircle. You still have the Tracy Whittem edge. You come to a sharp edge. Um, and so you can look at the global shape. You can look at the local edge statistics. You can look at the um, stuff going on in the Tracy Whittem uh, regime. 103 that we're sort of more interested in is let's call it heavy tailed random matrix theory. So the way we're thinking about this is, you know, basic Marchenko Pasteur, you're in a Gaussian universality class and you'd get a limiting distribution, you'd have fluctuations at the edge. Spiked covariance model is a perturbative approximation to that. It's a rank five approximate perturbation of that. So you have five spikes stick out, but you're still the same thing roughly. 
in it, with heavy tailed random matrix theory, it depends on how you generate it, levy plots, processes, or whether you exogenously specify a distribution. If you do that, it depends on whether the exponents are more than four, between two and four, or less than two, because you get four moment results. So it's a much more complicated space. Um, some of the results are proved at physics in, on the last three lines, physics level of rigor. Some of the results are mathematical. So I'm going to get into that on this slide. There's a lot of texture in this slide that I want to gloss over. Just to say that um, we sat on work by Bouchard and Potters from the 90s that some of you may be familiar with. And in the subsequent 20 years, is that there has been, an, you know, not a lot, but a little bit of work on sort of characterizing ideas in heavy tailed random matrices in various classes that, that sort of followed up on that that's relevant to what we're talking about. So from this, no theorems yet, but from this, we'll, we wanted to develop a theory of phenomenology. And essentially, we developed, the, the idea would be that if, if your bulk plus spike, the leading eigenvectors capture information. And so you could throw the bottom ones away. And that captures the notion of implicit regularization, right? Um, and so it captures the idea that there's regularization in the model. But we've, we've put no regularization explicitly in the model, except via the many knobs of the training process. And so what we are saying basically is that there's a self-regularization, the training process itself. You may or may not know that you're doing this, but the training process itself induces these eigenvalues. And you can basically be in three places. You can, if you squint at it, look like Marchenko Pasteur, top left. You can look like bulk plus spike, top right. You can look like your heavy tail, which is sort of presented in the bottom middle poorly. <clears throat> you can be a transition between these two. So you look like the spikes are pulling out at the edge. And so the shape of the eigenvalues near the edge looks like you may have a few spikes pulling out. The convexity shape of this envelope could be different. So you could be between the bulk plus spike and the heavy tailed. And then there's a degenerate case. Empirically, if you look at it, oftentimes in, in real models, you see rank, what we'll call rank collapse. Um, if you're really a random matrix and your aspects ratio is not one, so say it's two or more, you never see eigenvalues that are zero, right? And so seeing eigenvalues that are zero means you're not random. And so if you have a rank collapse, there's, there's a, typically a degeneracy going on. So there's three shapes, Gaussian universality, bulk plus spike, say heavy tailed on the eigenvalues, and then there's transitions between them in various point cases. So from this theory, you can develop a phenomenology that sort of makes predictions about various things. So from this perspective, Trained models pre-2013 are bulk plus spike. You may not know that you're doing it. You may not write down a statistical model, but what you trained was a bulk plus spike model. There's, there's a random matrix piece and there's five or 10 spikes sticking out. So smaller, older models have the traditional regularization. You have a ridge term, right? You have some signal and then ridge stuff that gets put into an MP bulk. And you deal with sort of with the usual techniques. Um, what we're calling heavy-tailed self-regularization is that the weight matrices are strongly correlated. So the W transpose W have a heavy tail over eigenvalues. There's various mechanisms for this. We're not going to posit mechanisms. And the quote, quote theory does not require a mechanism. It just requires the phenomenology. Um, so the eigenvalues in the heavy are heavy-tailed, not, not weights. So this is not theorem. I'm heavy-tailed on weights. Therefore, I'm heavy-tailed on eigenvalues. You scale one or fixed scale Gaussian universality on weights, but this very subtle correlations into the weights that are built during the training process that manifest themselves in heavy tail and eigenvalues. So this is a theory and, and, and I, there's a phenomenology. And I said that you should have more regularization. Um, you know, and so this would make predictions that if you, if you had the shape of the eigenvalues, depending on how you fit the eigenvalues, I would want my the, the shape of my eigenvalues to be in the heavy tailed universality class. And from other reasons, I know that it should be in the two to four regime, not the four and above, not the less than two. I should be in the two to four regime and my eigenvalues should be closer to two. And so this would make predictions. If you change batch size, or you change step size, or you change the parameters, that should move you around that regime and that could be predictive of model quality. Short answer, you see that. That's sort of cute, but what does that have to do with something real? So now you can, you can ask questions about how that does something real. So we, we have a, if you don't believe us, you know, you can pip install Weight Watcher. So we're gonna be analyzing weight matrices. We're not doing training. And so by analyzing weight matrices, you can download the tool Weight Watcher. And the idea is to analyze pre-trained models and, 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 and learn things from them. So we have a theory that, that says that um, a phenomenology based on these five plus one phases of learning that makes a statement about how a model should perform because of this implicit regularization that's, that's induced. And so we may want to make predictions. If, if I change some height parameter, you know, how does something change? If I look at early versus later models, how does something change? And this is a practical matter. 
Um, these things cost a hundred million dollars, you know, compute to do. So if I have a budget, should I hire more engineers or should I buy more data or buy more compute? I mean, these are very practical questions. And so having a finer understanding of these sort of random matrix ideas um, would, would help with that. So let's say that I want to predict model quality. This is a common thing and not on a toy little thing on BERT. If, if you don't know what BERT is, BERT is, is, is a state-of-the-art natural language model that's incredibly big that, that is getting sort of a lot of attention. There's a lot of work in machine learning on using norm-based metrics, you know, alpha, if, if Fabinius norm or spectral norm. By doing fitting of the uh, eigenvalue distributions using the ideas from heavy-tailed random matrix theory, um, you can back out essentially shape parameters, fitted parallel exponents and so on. And so then you could say, I want to use that to come up with metrics that are predictive of model quality. So can I do that? So there's a lot of information on this slide. I'm gonna gloss over the details except to say the answer is yes. So read the title and the footnote. So this is a, a paper that appeared in Nature on Communications and we put it there because it, it was a broad enough exposure that we wanted to get sort of a general, um, general audience understanding, not, not you know, the sort of most recent um, machine learning venue where um, we wanted to frame the question to say, listen, we want to, um, in, in a context where you're not gonna share with me your data, you're not gonna, um, share with me your hyperparameters. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't wanna ask a non-reproducible question. I want to ask a question, say that you give me absolutely no data. Say that you give me no information about your hyperparameters. You just give me your model. Can I say whether it's good or bad? This is a very practical question. It gets, I think, less attention in sort of academic machine learning, but it's a very practical question. And the long story short is that you can use ideas, phenomenology we developed, that's gonna to lead to the theorems I'll describe, um, to, predict trends in the state, in the quality of state-of-the-art neural networks without access to any training data and testing data. And so the basic idea is that um, we're looking at weight matrices. We're looking at layers of weight matrices. What are weight matrices? We're talking about it from the perspective of random matrix theory and eigenvalues and heavy-tailed eigenvalues and Tracy Widom. What weight matrices are, they're just data. Right, you take data, you, you normalize it in some way, you still call it data. You mean center in some way, you still call it data. What these weight matrices, what these complicated state-of-the-art neural network models are doing is simply that in, in a much more complicated way that depends on the data and errors, but it's, it's transforming the data to new features or to new representations. So it might be plausible that if, if you just have access to the model, so this is very different than the usual training testing setup in statistics and machine learning, right? We have a cross-validation set and training and testing and so on. All you have is the model. So what are, what are sort of general principles for good models? And so what we're saying is we can look at the models, we can use ideas from metrics derived from heavy trail tailed random matrix theory, and we can predict trends in the quality of state-of-the-art models without access to any training data or testing data. And so how, how could this work or why would this make sense? I think the rough idea is that good models are of a certain size and good models squeeze out correlations of many, let's say size scales from the data. So if I, what do I mean by many size scales and many scales? I mean, if you think about how random matrix theory is applied in finance, think about long temporal autocorrelations that are heavy tailed. Um, so in, in machine learning, you, know, you may not be looking at a model of temporal autocorrelations, but you, know, you might see a similar thing in, um, in, uh, in images, right? You have your eye and your eyeball is a little bit larger and your hair is a little bit higher and there's some stuff going on. So over many size scales, you cook in these sort of correlations that help you to make sort of good predictions. I mean, you can think of heavy tail decay in, in um, wavelet coefficients in natural images, if you're familiar with that. You can think sort of informally that the structure of natural language has correlations built in at, three, at the three word level and at the nine word level and at the 27 word level at the 81 word level. You know, so over many sort of size scales in the, temp, in the sort of uh, sequential structure that is, is the natural language document you're reading. So the idea is that those correlations, when you pound on it with lots of compute and lots of data, manifest themselves in the weight matrices. And so you can predict trends in the quality of state-of-the-art neural networks just by looking at the weight matrices, much better than norms, much better than any of the many, many metrics people sort of look at. And the vast majority of those metrics assume you have access to the training protocols, the data, or some other things. You can do it here just looking at the weight matrices, being a little bit careful about the random matrix ideas, right? There's some subtleties there, but, but you can do that. Um, you can use this for a range of different things. Um, you can, you can um, analyze pre-trained models. If you know VGG versus ResNet versus DenseNet, the certain properties there, and you can say, you know, how do the models behave? 
Um, are there some layers that are more overtrained versus undertrained, et cetera? So you can answer questions like this in a range of other questions having to do with scale collapse or if the models broke, broken in some way, you can ask if, if uh, you broke it um, with sort of um, post-processing and so on. So there's a range of things. I'll just put this um, you know, up um, and I'm gonna, in terms of buzzwords, you know, let's call it correlation flow, understanding how information propagates through the model using these heavy tailed random matrix ideas. Scale collapse of some eigenvalues choked to zero. Correlation traps. So I said that you do not see heavy tails in the elements, you see them in the weights. Now, occasionally, not heavy tails, but you see some large matrix elements. And usually when you see some large matrix elements, that's sort of a bad thing, right? You, know, you might say that you've overfit to something, but in terms of the dynamics of training, that could actually give you something at a larger size scale that sort of allows you to glom onto it and, um, and, and get correlations at a larger size scales. Now, the question is, is that good or bad? I mean, I don't know, that's just a fact of the world. It's a mathematical fact. And so, um, a particular thing that I thought was pretty interesting here is the result that we had a couple of years ago, not on weights, but on Hessians, but I'll, I'll convolve the two, but, but it's, tech, it's on Hessians, not weights, where we were looking at the random matrix theory applied to Hessians in a, in a class of models that generalize, generalize linear models. And so there, the usual idea is your bulk plus spike. Here, the bulk could become unbounded, the bulk, um, could have all sorts of other shapes depending on, on the form of the generalized generalized linear model. You could get analytic results using certain techniques I'll get to in a moment. Um, but something that I thought was particularly interesting is people usually think when there's, there's a bulk and there's spikes and if the spikes stick out, that means there's some signal in the data, period, full stop. So find a spike and then interpret it as a signal in the data. Um, theorem, depending on the details of the knobs of this model, you can have spikes in the absence of any data whatsoever, just due to the form of the model. So, you know, due to parameters inside the model, um, you, can have, you can have unbounded distributions for the empirical spectral distributions, but you can have bounded distributions, compact distributions with a, a few spikes that stick out and the spikes are in the absence of any data. It's just due to the curvature properties of the model. So um, beware looking for spikes and interpreting them, especially for machine learning models. We have a million knobs and you're changing all these sort of, um, 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 sort of structural shape of the, of the objectives. Um, this, this was the case in, in a very partic particular setup, but, but I think it, it's true um, more generally because a lot of these models are sort of convolved version of these layers. So let me just put a pin in that. Um, but this is the example, the sort of thing you could, you could find um, spikes that are purely artifacts of the shape of the model. Okay. So we use this. And so what are the sort of theorems you might want to pull out from this? Um, there's a bunch of things. So for example, that Hessian result I was telling you about the shape of the bulks um, are reasonably universal. The details of the spikes are not. So they depend on like skewness or kurtosis of various parameters of, of the loss function, the generalized version of the GLM model. Um, so this is sort of interesting, right? Um, this, these are finite size models. So there's non-trivial finite size effects. And we can see spikes sticking out well outside the analog of the tracy Whittem edge. And these models do just to the shape of the model. And so, um, I think a common theme here is we're going to be using eigenvalues. We're going to be using matrix techniques at the end of the day. We had to, we had to relate those back to matrix techniques. But an, another common feature of this is that, um, back to the question, you know, if, if the data grows a factor of 10 or 100, the model is going to grow larger. And so you're really going to be in a limit that's more like a thermodynamic limit. So you're not going to be in a concentration regime where you're going to get johnson linden strice type bounds, or you're going to get matrix concentration bounds, you're more in a regime like a thermodynamic limit, but that's not the case. And so I want to describe a little bit more so the setup for these more um, theorem based sort of methods that we're looking at and applied to machine learning problems and why we're doing that. But think of that you're in the regime where there's, you know, you're not converging to, to a well defined limit. And so if, if you know what deterministic equivalent techniques are, we're going to be using those, namely, we're going to come up with a deterministic equivalent such that when you query it in certain ways, for example, with, with um, quadratic form queries, if you're just in eigenvalues and eigenvectors, then it will give you the same answer as, as a matrix in that limiting regime would, the random matrix in that limiting regime would. Okay, so machine learning and what is peculiar about that for random matrix theory. So um, we're in the limit where N and P diverge together. Um, there's an, sort of an extra subtlety that you may have a couple layers that are convolved together non-linear, so there may be another parameter and the number of internal features. 
And so there's a number of counterintuitive phenomena that aren't just the usual high dimensional thing and you concentrate to be, have all your mass on a unit shell and, and distances concentrate. Um, when you're in this called thermodynamic regime, um, the scale of the fluctuations is the scale of the distances. And so, and so um, a lot of the norm-based techniques um, like Chernoff would, would break down. Um, and so let's say I'm in, for lack of a better terminology, sort of a low dimensional where, you know, the dimension's fixed, P is fixed, and the number of data points diverge versus high dimension. So there's sort of an easy case where um, the low dimensional intuition holds. Um, you might use a Johnson, you might do a non-asymptotic or an asymptotic form of this, but, you know, johnson linden strauss if you want a non-asymptotic form or, or make a marchenko pasteur um, there's a harder regime where um, this sort of intuition, I think, largely collapses and the data vectors are sort of approximately the same Euclidean distance regardless. So let me give you a particularly simple example of that. Um, so say that I want to do classification between two clusters and um, the usual picture would be something like I have here. I have a cluster of red and a cluster of, of blue. The distance between the two clusters is pretty large. So when you're in this therm thermodynamic regime, um, well, in, in the high dimensional case, you can get something like that's a little bit noisier. You know, here's a particular setup where I have um, um, data points that, you know, drawn from two Gaussian distributions. And uh, you, you can look at a situation, say, N is a thousand, I don't know if it's a thousand or 500 here, and P is, is five, the number of, of features, the dimension. And what you can see is that the histograms of distributions between things in class A versus A and B um, are very different. So you could cut right here and you could come up with a more sophisticated rule that might allow you to cut based on distances, nearest neighbor distances or something. If you have the same setup, a thousand points, um, but P is now not five, but 200 or 250, and you look at the pairwise histograms, it looks more like on the right, they're right on top of each other. And so the picture might be more like this. So it's not the case typically that you would in, in, in this thermodynamic regime where you'd have two clusters Let's look at the, I don't know how good the uh, screen is for you, but um, the, the top left here on, on the left-hand side, the top left and bottom right are, are dark. The two cross terms are lighter. You say this is a, a stochastic block model. You find an eigenvector, you cut it in half. Um, if you're in this regime um, where P is large or diverges scales with N, pairwise distance information looks like the right. That you know, It's just totally not discriminative. Now you can still find this information with an eigenvector in, in cut and classify this. But what this is to say is that if your theorem, if your theory says theorem, I'm in this limit um, and I have a picture, two clusters that are sort of well separated, this is why my eigenvector spectral clustering works. I mean, really that has very little to say about this, this regime because in this regime, um, you, you have the pairwise distances. If, if you look at things pairwise, these things are just right on top of each other. And so something else has to be going on. What is it is a little more subtle, but it has, something else has to be going on. So um, technically, you know, you want to estimate a population covariance from n data points, and, and so you have an n by p matrix. You can use the plug-in maximum likelihood estimator. Um, and so the question is: Is c hat minus c is is the norm of that small quantified with a marchenko pasteur and a limit quantified with matrix Chernoff? Um, and the answer is no. If, if n and p are diverging together, you may converge, but not in this element-wise, but but not in this in this matrix norm sense. And basically, this just has to do with norm inequalities. That, that the uh, infinity versus L1 versus spectral norm of the matrix of singular values are quote equivalent, but only up to a factor of p, which is now diverging with you. Um, so theorem matrix concentration, you get something of the top form, which is non-asymptotic. Typically, Marchenko Pasteur uses rather different techniques. You get something like on the bottom. So probably many of you are, are familiar with this, of course. Um, and, and this is the sort of plot that I'd have for more general audiences, but you know, the question might be, when are you in this regime? And, and the answer is almost always, right? I mean, if your aspect ratio is 100, I mean, who has an aspect ratio in their matrices of 100? You're still in this regime. I mean, you have a huge, you're not, you know, you're not a, the, the bulk is not a Delta spike. The bulk is pretty spread out actually. All right, um, so you're almost always in this regime. Okay, so let's, so, so what's going on here is a few things. One is a claim about a regime. Two is a claim about what we might want from these models. So the change of intuition, this motivated by the weight analysis we did that showed that the eigenvalues didn't look at all like this. We took a step back and we said, sort of what, what's of interest here and what do we want to be doing? So one, we see very different behavior for what, what let's call it the large versus small dimensional limits or the concentration versus thermodynamic regimes. For linear models, you know, low rank approximation, spectral classification, least squares, and so on, you'll get very different properties. 
Um, and in many cases, you can generalize it to, to nonlinear models, look, kernel spectral clustering, various sorts of um, nonlinearities that are building blocks for, for state of the art neural networks. So the key sort of technical challenge here is a lot of classical random matrix theory focuses basically on eigenvalue distributions. And if you want eigenvectors, you have to use very different techniques. Um, and so you spend time talking about the local edge statistics, the Tracy Whittem edge, I mean, these sort of things. Um, for a lot of machine learning applications, that's good, you want that. But um, in many other ones, you don't. In many other ones, you need eigenvectors. You may need other types of functionals of, of the matrices. So that example I had a few slides ago, this, the eigenvalues just don't matter particularly in, in and of itself. Here you see that the pairwise distances aren't discriminative. What you want, so the eigenvalues, um, the, what you want is an eigenvector, and then you want a functional of this. You want to dot this, you want to sweep cut over this eigenvector and split this eigenvector and split the nodes, and, you know, the data points into two pieces based on this eigenvector. So you, you want an eigenvector and some functional of it. And that eigenvector may or may not correspond to an eigenvalue that is well separated from a bulk, if you have sort of some heavy tailed shape. So you want some eigenvector. Um, you may want other things also, your derivatives or other, other types of functionals. So um, the, the sort of pretty picture that describes um, the general approach sort of that we were, had and that um, underlie the Hessian approach and, the, and other, other uh, results along those lines, um, a lot of random matrix theory uses the resolvent, but, but only a filtered form of it, only through the Stilch's transform. And from that, you can get um, eigenvalue distributions, as, as many of you know. Um, take a step back, work with the resolvent directly, and it could be a general matrix. It, um, it could be a general matrix that you just look at, at it in a covariance matrix form. It could be a more it could be a more specific type of matrix having to do with something that basically is a bulk plus spike or basically is corresponds to a least squares model or some other sort of linear models that are used in machine learning, computing eigenvalues or something with latent semantic indexing. So take that matrix and which is essentially a statistical model and look at the resolvent of that. Um, one thing you can do is, of course, transform it and work on the steel just transform of that thing, but you can also work on just the resolvent of that thing directly. Um, now, that's a harder thing to work with, but um, you can do that. And in this limit, this thermodynamic regime we're talking about, um, the quantities of interest typically will not converge, but you can use deterministic equivalent techniques to say, listen, I want to construct a deterministic equivalent. So when I query this matrix, this resolvent matrix, in various ways with quadratic form functions, for instance, uh, quadratic form operations, then I will get the same answer as, as I would on the random quantity. And so from this, in, in a relatively clean and straightforward way, you can get eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a set of linear functionals. Um, you, you can have a master theorem that, that for a range of sort of linear operations, a corollary of which is least squares and low rank and, and things. Um, you don't have a master theorem in the more general nonlinear case, but you can you can handle these ideas in a, in a more one-off way, depending on the on the particular form of, of the nonlinearity that, that you have. So you can get eigenvalues and eigenvectors and other linear functionals, um, inverses, trace, and other sort of bilinear forms, integration and differentiation involved in these quantities. Um, something that seems very different that we came to very differently, but turns out to be very related, is we were using techniques from randomized linear algebra having to do with projections that most analysis typically goes through Johnson Lindenstrass or subspace embeddings, which is Johnson Lindenstrass and a Euclidean space, basically. And we said, you know, um, or, or leverage scores, we sample actual columns, and leverage scores are a non uniformity measure that tells you the, the actual columns to choose. Um, leverage scores can be viewed as a marginalized versions of essentially deterministic point process distributions. And so we're able to use that in randomized linear algebra. Um, you may know DPPs because they're related to eigenvalues and random matrix theories and a range of other things. And so we were able to come up with connections essentially where you can, you can not just in an asymptotic way get um, asymptotic analogs of, of more traditional random matrix results, but um, non-asymptotic versions by using non-asymptotic analysis of these underlying resolvent matrices. And they relate to ideas, um, Michal Jasinski did, did a lot of the work here, relate to ideas um, on DPPs and, and volume sampling that came out of randomized linear algebra. So um, as an example, um, let me not go into, I, I talked about this ex example of, of kernel spectral clustering. So let me uh, just in the interest of time, go into this in a little bit less detail. Um, but you can use this approach and um, this sort of quote explains why in this regime where 
n is a thousand and five hundred and p is two hundred and fifty. Um, this classification works. It's because um, distance, the pairwise distance, I, I, I don't get anything discriminative, but I can come up with a deterministic equivalent. And when I hit that with, with quadratic forms, um, it would give me the answer that, that I would want in terms of this classification. So that's sort of quote why um, this clustering works in this regime, whereas you know the, the picture you might typically see um, is this, and, and that's just false in terms of how the data would actually look in that regime. And um, the, the toyest of data you can find might have a little bit of distance structure, but anything else doesn't. Um, so um, if you, a little slightly more technically, if, if you look at this sort of kernel spectral, ignore the top half, which has to do with the local linearization, which is sort of also relevant, but you can ignore it for now. You can look at these things entry-wise and, and you know, there, there's a scale to the behavior of this. Um, and so this is the same phenomenon that we had before because, um, the spectrum wise bound is order one. It's not going to go to zero in, in this regime. Um, and, and so the bounds you'd get from asymptotic analysis um, when, when you're not in this quote thermodynamic regime where N and P are diverging together um, would just be completely different. So you, you see this for a sort of a wide range of things. You see this for random features. Um, there's been a lot of interest in using random features as a toy model for neural networks and random features have an intermediate layer. If you let one of the parameters diverge to infinity, you can use Chernoff or, or marchenko pasteur type analysis and say, listen, I, I, uh, I, get, I get results converging to a, a nice familiar sort of um, Gaussian kernel. Um, what if I'm not in that regime? The answer is that, is that just totally chokes. If you use the methods I was describing, it turns out you can, um, you can get a result where you basically correspond to a rotated version of that. So there's an angular rotation basically. So I don't converge to the Gaussian, I converge to something else where the, the angular rotation corresponds to the exact value of the, of the parameter ratio. Um, and so um, this is an example of sort, of, sort of explaining why a toy single hidden layer neural network with a certain um, non-linearity um, might perform as it does. Um, uh, let me... A lot of these things, so, so the key idea here is that um, when you're in this thermodynamic regime, you can use this more fine scaled random matrix techniques. Um, and you essentially have two different phases. This is probably well known to random matrix people. I think machine learning, um, this was off their radar until a few years ago, um, basically because most of their analysis techniques went through Johnson Lindenstrass or matrix Chernoff, namely went to a limit where the number of data points diverged um, and you kept the model size fixed. When you're in this regime, you can see qualitatively different behavior depending on, on various, say, in this case, the value of the regularization parameter or, or ratio of n over n. Um, now, in statistical mechanics and other areas of random matrix theory, right at the transition point, um, certain logarithmic derivatives diverge, like a heat capacity in statistical mechanics or other volume notions in random matrix theory. And this got a lot of attention in machine learning. It was called the double descent phenomenon. And the idea is your bias variance trade-offs in this regime. But if you have many more parameters and you condition on going to low norm solutions, then, um, then your models can get just monotonically larger and you just pound on them and, and things always get better. So what was surprising to me when I first saw this was that this was surprising to anyone. And as we scraped at this a little bit, it was very clear it became surprising because the most of the analysis tools machine learners were using were going to this limit, which were Chernoff or MP so it was appropriate, not this thermodynamic regime where you need to use these deterministic equivalents and ask these finer scale questions by analyzing the resolver directly. Um, okay, so recap, this, this, these double descent things are basically sort of well understood in terms of this, this regime with random matrices. Okay, so um, let me wrap up with that. I have some take home messages here on the theorem part. Um, big open question, what we have not done is applied the, this, this technique of deterministic equivalence where we fail to get certain types of concentration, but we can get certain other types if we use deterministic equivalents, um, back to something subtle like heavy-tailed weight matrices, which you do not see in practice, and the weight matrices with heavy tails and eigenvalues, which you do see on practice. So, um, so I see that the time is up, so I don't want to run over, and I want to pause if there's questions. And hopefully we'll have another meeting in a year or two and we'll have an answer to this open problem that we're sort of currently working on is how to extend these um, deterministic equivalents and related techniques to the heavy tailed um, 
spectral ESD spectral distributions that, that were the original motivation um, and that we have a good theory for, but not yet theorems for. But we have a whole bunch of theorems applying this um, in regimes for spectral clustering. And so we have a, um, a, we have a review that we're sort of, um, was, I was hoping would be finished by this meeting in the beginning of the summer, it's delayed a few months, so hopefully by the end of the summer. But it's implicit in some of the papers like the Hessian one where you had this sort of um, this um, spike that was just due to the form of the model, but we're writing something up sort of in a, in a sort of a more simple way to really explain how you can use these um, random matrix ideas directly on the resolvent for a wide range of sort of machine learning problems. So with that, let me wrap up and thank you for uh, the attention.